Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, um, former honorees um, here tonight, and obviously many who can't be with us but who we're thinking of. What an honor. Emma, thank you. You're my hero, and to hear that from you is just huge. I'm so honored at receiving this important award and recognition um, from those of you at PAGE, because I know all too well the extent of the great talent here in this room and among our members. Having been active on both the PAGE board, on the Globalization Task Force, but also bringing in new members, and more and more members we bring in, the more talent we have in this room. And so to be recognized with this award is just huge. Thank you. I wouldn't be here tonight for a number of reasons. And I think it's fair to say the first reason is I wouldn't be here tonight without my husband, Michael, who's uh, joining me for the first time at one of these conferences. He's heard me talk about Paige for years. <laughs> Having someone behind you who has absolute rock solid belief in what you do and what you believe in and support you, you can do anything, one has wings, and I've had such wings because of my husband. So, um, wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I also wouldn't be here, and, and obviously they're, they're not here now, but uh, with so many great team members I've had at ECHO, um, here in the US, in Europe, and around the world, who have inspired me and energized me um, and they've really sort of challenged me to do better each time. So um, they have been fantastic. And obviously, and thirdly, I wouldn't be here without you at Page and all those wonderful people here today and, and those who aren't with us, but who have inspired me. Um, I don't dare count the number of years I've been at Page, certainly 10, maybe more. Um, but the passion, the energy, the wisdom that collectively you represent, um, that's actually been on the board. As I've said to Roger many, many times, I have learned so much just sitting in those board meetings and watching, is it 36 voices around the table, harnessed sometimes at the end of a squawk box, but harnessed so positively and constructively has just been an eye-opener. It's been a real journey of discovery, and for that I am hugely grateful, hugely grateful. It's fair to say I've been blessed with many mentors and many dear friends, um, and it would be wrong if I didn't mention some of those who've meant a lot to me on my journey. Um, and I would probably start with actually the first international page member um, called Tim Travis Healy, and he's just now been featured on Page's oral history collection, so I commend any of you who, uh, who've not seen it to, uh, to see that cameo, it's a very impressive overview. But Tim has been huge for me, as has other people not here, Reginald Watts, Roger Hayes, Bjorn, who I know can't be with us, Gary Sheffer, who can't be with us, um, and two former chairmen I had in New York. Um, Harold Burson was a chairman of ECHO for a little while, as was Michael Morley, and again, they've been tremendous for me but importantly to so many leaders who are here and who um, I would like to call out. Bill, um, having had the privilege and the pleasure of working with you, being your friend, uh, watching you has been a true discovery. Roger, again, chairing our meetings, pulling us all together, getting us to great places. Amy, you're my hero, and so your words of welcome meant so much to me. Peter Debrissini, Meryl MacDonald, John Iwata, and Ray Jordan, I am so excited to have you here in this room. We've missed you at several of these PAGE events, and you have been tremendous. Working with you and those on the PAGE board and so many friends I have here today has been a real privilege, and I'm constantly grateful for that. As I say, on the shoulder of giants. I mentioned earlier on, I think it was to Tom, that I wrote these remarks probably in my head, certainly, soon after I got the wonderful call from Bill earlier this summer. 
And what I'm going to be sharing with you is sort of what we've been living the last couple of days. So I really did not write this this morning, um, but it sort of feels like perhaps I have, because it's pulling together what we've been going through these last couple of days. Um, because I do think we live in extraordinary times, from fake news, clickbaits, bots and trolls, to a world and society in need of the best and committed solutions to address its many huge and threatening imbalances. It is an extraordinary time. I think you call it an inflection point that we've reached. And in all this, in the midst of disrupted and mistrusted institutions and mistrusting generations, helping the many organizations we work for or represent to evolve, to transform, to be better. That is a challenge and responsibility I think we all face. Never before has strategic communication been so important. And so too, I'd say, guidance and signposts along the way to make sure that we are making a difference in what we do. Like Homer's Ulysses, knowing where is home and how to get there, bypassing sirens, cyclops, storms, we have to be strong, and we have to know ourselves, individually and corporately, guided by a sound compass to help us on our journey for the better. As Amos said, I've been in the reputation research business for close to 30 years, aiming to empower those who want a voice and those who want to listen. I think this is probably because I'm the youngest of four sisters, and I had to fight pretty hard to get my voice heard and to be listened to around our very noisy table. So I started young. During my school years, I used to follow my father, who was the Director General of the Canadian Public Relations Society. I used to go to conferences around the country, and I'd help him in the back office stuff, um, stuff all the programs, because we used to have big programs in those days. And I'd attend all the plenary sessions from about 14 years. I then went on to take Canada's first uh, degree course in public relations in Halifax. When I graduated, I ended up in London, um, and I was a 25-year-old head of communications for uh, PA management consultants. And there, too, I tried hard to get my voice heard. I wanted the partners to stop, to think, to be mindful about our communications. At the time, the only thing the partners wanted to be was actually in the Financial Times, preferably every day if they possibly could. And when I'd say, could we just look at our messaging and our positioning and just think about what we're saying here, they'd just go, no, 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 off you go, little girl, and carry on doing what you're doing. And you think, and I then asked them if I could do a benchmark study among our customers and our prospects and our influencers just to see what the rest of the world thought of us. And they sort of said, yes, fine, off you go and do this. And I did. And I came back, and I had all the partners around me, and I was the, I must admit, at that time, I was the only uh, female in the room. And I put up, my first slide was of our first, well, one of our largest clients basically leaving our firm, going to another competitor, because they didn't think we did what they wanted us to do, and that another firm offered the solution that they wanted. And in fact, it was something we already did, but we just never talked about. So suddenly that aha, communications matters. Aha, communications is material. Aha, we need to think about our messaging. Aha, I fell in love with research. And I just thought, how powerful is it when you come back with the evidence and say, how can we actually learn from this for the better? At the time, I also got to see media analysis as practiced in the US and wanted to bring it to Europe and um, tried to set up a company and uh, went to a bank. And the bank sort of said, you know, media analysis, never heard of it. It's never been done. It's untried, untested, unproven in Europe. We're not backing you. And by the way, everyone agrees that PR cannot be measured. This is not a business that you can, you can develop. So my husband with his... Um, unshaking belief in me, uh, and I said, yes, we will put our house up with the bank, that's our security, um, we'll put everything on the line, and we will um, go into this business. So Michael carried on his day job, and uh, luckily, 
I didn't take a salary for about three years. I grew the company, Echo as it was, and then had children and begged Michael to keep his day job, not to stop just yet. Um, and as he's here tonight, there's obviously a number of things we must have done right at the time. We're not too wrong. But media analysis in those days, um, very interesting. It's not that long ago. Um, but it was about couriers delivering boxes and boxes and boxes of press cuttings and radio tapes and television recordings to be analyzed, to be dissected, and to be reported upon. I could only dream of paperless offices um, as our sort of shelves groaned under this sort of this maelstrom of clippings and, and, and uh, dusty collection because those were the days of the thud factor of success. It was interesting too because the communications research approach itself wasn't recognized um, and there was no official body to represent us. The PR industry said you're not really PR, you're research. The market research industry said you're not really market research, we don't know what you are. So I started the Association for Media Evaluation Companies as it was known then, AMEC, and turned to the academically recognized principles of content analysis as the foundation of legitimacy. There are perhaps four or five other agencies doing it at the time as well. And with that, the communications research and evaluation business, certainly in Europe, began. But as we all know, and particularly in this room, communications is so much more than about quantity and volume. Winston Churchill corresponded with my father during the war, and he said many things. But one of the things he observed was, on serious issues, I listen seriously. According to least important, what is being said. More importantly, how it's being said. And most importantly, who said it. In our noisy digital times, I believe that active listening is more important now than ever before. To understand where and how the winds are shifting and moving and why. I have a default belief in the unique voice we bring to our organizations. And really powered by research, helping our organizations navigate through these winds, squalls, and challenges for the better. From those dusty days of media clips and no one believing PR could be measured, most now appreciate and understand the connection between output and output measures of communication to impact measures on stakeholder perceptions, and above all, the important material outcome measures on behavior such as loyalty, advocacy, choice, and trust. We can now actually put a hard financial value on reputation, that intangible asset that now actually we can finally quantify, clearly mapping it as a contributor to lasting business value. But while at least 30% of corporate value is underpinned by reputation, still too many focus on actually stop at measuring outputs. This has to change. We need to challenge ourselves on thinking about delivering outcomes and minding the gap between where we are, and where we want to be, and the challenging stakeholder expectations in between. When measuring reputation, one has to be clear that it's reputation for what, among whom, for what purpose. Given what's at stake, data analytics should be not just about click-throughs. Reputation is a prism and needs to be considered across the spectrum of those who matter, and from that, how it drives choices, behavior, and value. In terms of value creation, there's an interconnection and an interdependency between an organization and its employees, its customers, its suppliers, shareholders, financial institutions, and other stakeholders. When aligned around purpose and values, as we've been hearing over the last few days, the beneficiaries are the economy, the environment, society. These are not small, insignificant issues. In my experience, while I'd agree that not everything can be measured, I also know that what's not measured is neglected. So being clear about reputation and the impact of strategic communications is key to transformation and success. This is my North Star and the voice I'm continuously striving for 
to support and challenge improvement ahead. Seen through the arc of 30 years in this industry, we've clearly come a long way. Things have moved on so rapidly and fundamentally, and will continue to do so, with AI, cognitive computing, the internet of things, all things digital, with human minds hopefully focused on purpose. And there's no turning back. Social media has changed the world forever. It has changed society, behavior, social skills, invoked wars and uprisings, and even completely developed a new language. In our fractious, disrupted, demanding, and chaotic world, the youth of today are seen as our answers for tomorrow. But we mustn't wait or pass off our responsibility. This is the time for the communications profession to act and lead with courage, as catalysts of purposeful change, stewards of the future, transforming business for the better. From atoms to bytes, and from value in the intangible to value in the, from value in the tangible to value in the intangible, we're moving from and to a different world, where deeper information through sound data gives us essential knowledge and a clearer compass. As Page's mission calls on each of us, uniting the world's best communicators to transform business for the better. Someone once said that CCO stands for compassion, conviction, and optimism. I believe that with a combination of good data on one hand and absolute integrity, compassion, and conviction for change on the other, the human voice can achieve much. I sincerely thank each one of you for helping me reach a stage where I can proudly hold up this award <laughs> um, as a mark of achievement, but above all, I hope, as a mark of impact. Making a difference, making things better, there's still so much to do. As the author of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, said, we don't need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. We have the power to imagine better. Thank you. <laughs>